Straight ahead on Law and Crime Daily. The latest on the nationwide search for Gabriel Petito. I haven't been able to talk to him. I wish I could talk to him. We hear from Brian Loudry's family for the first time since he returned home without his fiance. Plus, new developments in the Murdoch murder mystery. Officials now investigating a suspicious death close to the Murdoch family. And it's not rational to chase somebody unarmed with a firearm. Kyle Rittenhouse back in court ahead of his November trial. What the judge rules will be allowed in the 18 year old's murder trial. Plus, Law and Crime Daily is inverted watch as the fate of Robert Durst hangs in the balance. Hear the jury's instructions in the highly publicized murder trial. Law and Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law and Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. In a story that's captivating the nation, a cross-country search continues for missing 22-year-old Gabby Petito. After days of deafening silence from Petito's fiance, his sister is speaking out for the first time. Me and my family want Gabby to be found safe. She's like a sister and my children love her. And all I want is for her to come home safe and sound and this to be just a big misunderstanding. In an exclusive interview with Good Morning America, Casey Loudry says she's been trying to contact her brother since he returned to his family's Florida home. But so far, she's heard nothing. I haven't been able to talk to him. I wish I could talk to him. Back in July, Brian Loudry and Petito set off for a cross-country road trip. The vacation was cut short when Loudry mysteriously returned to Florida, driving Petito's van without her. Officials say the last time she was seen was weeks before near a national park in Wyoming. What's going on? How come you're crying? I'm just crying. We've just been fighting this morning. Some personal issues. Two weeks before she disappeared, Petito and Loudry were pulled over for a domestic disturbance near Arches National Park in Utah. Body camera video from Moab City Police shows Petito in an emotional state. Officers later confirmed Petito hit Loudry and that she suffered from anxiety. Is it bruised or tender or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. I'm fine. And I love Gabby. I, I hope she doesn't have too many complaints about me. <laughs> Officers considered it a mental health crisis and not a domestic abuse incident and helped separate the couple for the night. It looked typical of both of them. They, Whenever they'd fight, they would take a little break and come back and be fine because that's what you do in a couple. So far, police say Loudry has refused to cooperate and is considered a person of interest in the investigation. Meantime, officials work to determine whether Petito's disappearance is related to an unsolved double murder after bodies of two newlyweds were found near where Petito and Loudry were pulled over. Well, we share the frustration with, with the world right now. So, you know, two people went on a trip, one person returned, and that person that returned isn't providing us any information. Joining us today is criminal defense attorney Melba Pearson and Terry Austin. Melba, as a former prosecutor, break it down for us. You have someone so close to the case, they just look guilty, but there's no hard evidence to that fact, and he's lawyered up. So what can a prosecutor do? At this point, a prosecutor is going to have to work very closely with law enforcement to really try to uncover some evidence as to what happened to Gabby. I mean, that is the mystery that we're all grappling with right now. I think what's going to play a huge role is the cell phones in this case, right? Because they've been documenting a lot of their trips through using YouTube, uh, as well as reaching out to their family and friends. It's my understanding that the last call that came before she disappeared was was Gabby calling her mother. So the question would be, what cell phone tower was she pinging off of during that last call to help try to isolate the last known location of where she was? Also, we have to look at his cell phone as well, just to see, number one, are those phones traveling together? So in other words, does he have possession of her phone since she's been found, it's been named as missing? Or is her phone pinging somewhere else and he was in that location and now went into a different direction, which could potentially mean she came to a horrible end? We Absolutely. hope that that's not, not the case, but that is going to be a critical evidence in trying to figure out what happened to Gabby Petito. Absolutely. Terry, we've covered a lot of no-body murder cases, cold cases, and cases where bodies were found months later. With what you know so far, how do you see this next chapter in this tragic story? 
Well, Brian, right now, the authorities are just processing the information. Like Melba said, those phone records are going to be key. They don't have enough to charge. He's only a person of interest at this point. So I haven't even seen anything to make him a suspect at this case. So we're going to just have to wait and see what more evidence comes to light. Absolutely. We'll wait and see. And when we get that evidence, we'll present it to you, our viewers, here at the Law and Crime Daily. Looking ahead now, the trial of a U.S. airman accused of killing a Mennonite woman is set to begin next Tuesday in Arizona. 27-year-old Sasha Krause disappeared from her church community near Farmington, New Mexico, back in January 2020. She was last seen gathering material for a Sunday school class. Her body was found about a month later in a forest near Flagstaff. Officials say this man, Mark Gooch, shot and killed Krause. He is charged with her kidnapping and first-degree murder. If convicted, Gooch could face life in prison. The trial is expected to last for three weeks. Be sure to tune in to Law and Crime Network for gavel to gavel coverage. Turning now to North Carolina, where nearly 10 years after the death of university student Faith Hedgepeth, an arrest has finally been made in her murder. Nine years and nine days after her murder, Miguel Enrique Salguero Alvarez of Chapel Hill was arrested. Investigators used DNA evidence found at the crime scene to tie him to the 19-year-old's murder. Hedgepath's murder took the country by storm, dominating headlines and spawning true crime podcasts for years. Investigators say she was beaten in the head repeatedly and left to die alone in her Chapel Hill apartment. A roommate discovered her body. Salguero Alvarez is being held without bond in the Durham County Detention Center. From Smallville to the Big House, actress and former sex cult accomplice Allison Mack is now behind bars in federal prison. Mack, known for her role as Chloe Sullivan on Smallville, was convicted of two counts of racketeering for her involvement in the Nexium scandal. The 39-year-old admitted to playing a pivotal role in coercing and abusing victims into sexual acts with the cult's leader, Keith Raniere. Experts say she abused her celebrity power to lure in victims. Mack will serve her three-year sentence at the Federal Corrections Institute in Dublin, California. A California mom convicted of killing her 30-day-old baby with a lethal amount of meth passed on to the newborn through breast milk. Heather Marshhaus brought her infant daughter to the emergency room last December, where she later died after losing consciousness. Toxicology reports determined traces of methamphetamine were in her system, causing the death of her baby girl. Marshhaus pled guilty to voluntary manslaughter and is set to be sentenced in October. She is looking at six years in prison. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, Kenosha shooter Kyle Rittenhouse makes an appearance in court. But first, more twists and turns in the murder on murder mystery. Why the death of a family housekeeper is now being investigated. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. An unexpected twists and turns continue in the Murdoch murder mystery. Investigators now say they are investigating the 2018 death of the Murdoch family housekeeper. Gloria Satterfield was the Murdoch housekeeper for more than two decades before dying in a trip and fall incident at the family's home. A coroner now says her death was not reported at the time and no autopsy was performed. Officials also say Alec Murdoch has not paid up to Satterfield's children in a wrongful death lawsuit. All this comes after the South Carolina attorney turned himself into police on Thursday, admitting he orchestrated a botched plan to kill himself. 61-year-old Curtis Edward Smith was arrested after shooting Murdoch in the head on September 4th. Murdoch survived the incident. He claims the agreement was made so his surviving son would receive the proceeds from a $10 million life insurance policy. Back in June, Murdoch's wife and other son were found murdered at their South Carolina family home. On Thursday, Murdoch was sent back to rehab on a $20,000 personal reconnaissance bond. He claims to have been abusing opioids at the time of his attempted assisted suicide. Let's bring back co-host Terry Austin to break down the newest twist in this murder mystery. Terry, the Satterfield family is still waiting for their civil settlement. With Murdoch's life in such disarray, is there a way for them to get their settlement money? There is, Brian. Usually when you have a court-approved settlement in a civil case, 
you're going to have the judgment entered by the court. And once that judgment is entered by the court, the court is going to order the payment. Now, what they can do at this point is they can file a judgment lien. And if they do that, they could actually recover in South Carolina against the property of the Murdaugh estate. So if, in fact, they file this lien, they could get the house and they could sell the house. So even if he has no funds and he is claiming that he's destitute, they could still go after his real estate in South Carolina. All right, so that covers this, the civil aspect of this. Let's now switch gears and look at the criminal aspect. Terry, what do you make of how Gloria ended up dying? Like her death was handled seemingly poorly. Uh, no autopsy, but ruled a natural death. How does that work out? Well, you know, Brian, they really should have done an autopsy. As you know, there are five causes or manners of death, and it could be murder, suicide, accident, natural, or unknown. And here, the manner was accident. And when there's an accident like that, particularly if it's not on her own property and it's on someone else's property and it's her employer, you would think that they would have investigated a little bit better and looked at it and done an autopsy. So they shouldn't have done it that way. They should have definitely looked a little bit closer. Yeah, let's hope this wasn't a situation where it said, hey, we know this guy is a murder, uh, family member, big time South Carolina guy, and they just sweep it on the rugs. Let's hope that's not the case, but we'll see how that investigation continues. Thank you, Terry. Switching gears now to the federal court as the trial against R&B singer R. Kelly begins to wind down. Testimony heats up as R. Kelly's former employee and longtime assistant takes the stand. Former talent manager and executive assistant Cheryl Mack testified on Friday, detailing her perspective on some of Kelly's relationships. In one instance, Mack says she connected Kelly with a woman who later filed a lawsuit against him. After that, Kelly demanded Mack pick a side. During the testimony, Kelly seemed shocked, jerking back and forth while shaking his head. Kelly faces multiple charges at the federal level, including sex trafficking and racketeering. The state is expected to soon rest in their case, with the defense beginning on Monday. Witness testimony in the federal trial against Elizabeth Holmes reveals a pattern of inconsistency and errors with Theranos software. Friday marked day four of the federal trial where jurors heard from a former Theranos employee. After specifying that the company didn't always use human blood on their trials, witness Erica Chung confirmed many employees had concerns over problems with blood testing machine performance. She also said she and other employees felt scared while working at Theranos. Founded back in 2003, Holmes claimed the now defunct Theranos would revolutionize blood testing. Later, investigators found many issues with his programs. The former billionaire faces 12 fraud charges in connection to her time with the company. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, jury deliberations are underway in Robert Durst's murder trial, where the 12 men and women have to consider for Robert Durst's fate. Plus, what evidence will be admitted for the teen who opened fire at the Kenosha, Wisconsin protest? The judge's ruling next. It's not rational to chase somebody unarmed with a firearm, but he chose to do that, and he lives or dies with the consequences. Welcome back. Fallout from the 2020 shootings in Kenosha, Wisconsin, continue now as the hearing of Kyle Brinhouse begins ahead of his scheduled trial. The 18-year-old is charged in the deaths of Joseph Rosenbaum and Anthony Hubber, as well as injuring another person in August 2020. Officials say a then 17-year-old Rittenhouse wielded a rifle at the protest following the shooting death of Jacob Black. Rittenhouse's defense team argues he was acting in self-defense the night of the shootings. The prosecution and defense went back and forth on the widely publicized cell phone video taken before the shooting. In it, Rittenhouse can be seen threatening to shoot some black men walking out of a nearby CVS pharmacy. In the end, the judge ruled a decision will be made closer to the trial whether to allow or deny the video. In a hearing on Friday, the defense moved to exclude photos from evidence that show Rittenhouse posing with members of the so-called Proud Boys, a far-right political group. The judge granted this motion but says the prosecution may still attempt to prove Rittenhouse's involvement with the group. The defendant, I believe, uh, was drawn to this incident because of his beliefs, which are consistent with those of the Proud Boys. And I believe that those beliefs include a desire to use violence to support that philosophy. The Proud Boys are a well-known national organization. 
that takes pride in using violence to achieve their means, that takes pride in showing up at rallies and protests by what they consider to be their opposition. The defendant came to our community. He's not a resident. He's underage. He's out after curfew. He's armed with an illegal weapon. Why? That is the question. His state of mind, his intent that night, is a crucial issue in this case. Back to discuss what could be the final hearing before trial is co-host Terry Austin. Terry, do you think the prosecution's argument that anyone who donated to Rittenhouse's bail or bought free Kyle t-shirts should not be allowed on the jury will be successful? It might be successful. The prosecution actually made a motion to get the list of donors to these two charitable organizations. One was the Free Kyle USA, which is actually being run by his mother, and the other one was the Fight Back Foundation. And the judge denied the prosecution's motion because the judge said that that is not within the control of the defendant. This is a third party. He cannot order the defendant to show that type of information. But he didn't preclude the prosecution from getting those names. So if, in fact, the prosecution can get the list of donors, I do think at the end of the day, the judge might agree and say these donors should not be part of the jury. At the very least, I think it's going to come up in uh, jury selection as a question that they're going to ask potential jurors, and that may disqualify them. So we'll see how that plays out. Terry, this statement by Rittenhouse while watching a black man run out of a CVS, could the jury really hear that? And how is the prosecution going to use it? You know, I don't think they are going to hear it. The judge is very savvy. He's a no-nonsense judge. And under Rule 404B, he doesn't want anything to get into the trial that could be prejudicial. And he's saying here that this is showing propensity. It's not showing intent. It's not showing motive. So it probably is not going to get in at the end of the day, Brian. All right, we'll see how it plays out because, of course, the prosecution is going to be fighting tooth and nail to get it in. If it's not before the trial, then definitely during the trial, but we'll see how it ends up. Thank you very much, Terry. When we come back, what the jury has to consider when determining Robert Durst's future. Inside the complicated jury instructions and more next. Welcome back to Law & Crime Daily, continuing coverage of the verdict watch for the trial of Robert Durst. The real estate heir is accused of murder. The jury is finally in deliberations after four months of testimony. The state put on convincing evidence that Robert Durst murdered his best friend, Susan Berman, in her Benedict Canyon home in December of 2000. Durst is accused of killing Berman because of what the defense calls damning information about Durst's missing wife, Kathy. Kathy went missing in 1982, and though a body has never been found, Durst is suspected of committing her murder. During deliberations, the jury requested a timeline of the events that the prosecution displayed in their closing arguments. The judge denied this request, saying that it was not submitted into evidence. Law and Crime's Angela Levy explains what meticulous instructions the jury has been given to decide the fate of Robert Durst. Jury instructions can be tedious, but they're very important. They're essentially a roadmap for the jurors to follow while they're deliberating. You must not let bias, sympathy, prejudice, or public opinion influence your assessment of the evidence. Parts of the jury instructions read by Judge Mark Windham in Robert Durst's trial are pretty standard. The people are not required to prove that the defendant had a motive to commit the crime charged. But there are some things that are different that the jury will have to consider when weighing Robert Durst's fate. The defendant is guilty of first-degree murder if the people have proved that the defendant murdered while lying in wait. Meaning the jury has to find Durst concealed his purpose or had a secret plan. The instructions include special circumstances to the murder, including that Durst intended to kill Susan Berman. Two, Susan Berman was a witness to a crime. Three, the killing was not committed during the commission of the crime to which Susan Berman was a witness. And four, the defendant intended that Susan Berman be killed to prevent her from testifying in a criminal proceeding. The prosecution must also prove Durst used a firearm intentionally to find him guilty of first-degree murder and that it caused Berman's death. However, evidence of the defendant fled cannot prove guilt by itself. For Law and Crime Daily, I'm Anjanette Levy. Thanks, Anjanette. Terry, 
What do you think must be going through Prosecutor John Lewin's head right now as he waits for a verdict? <laughs> You know, that's one of the most difficult times waiting for a verdict. He's probably thinking, what more could I have said? But really, Brian, what he should be thinking is, what less could he have said? I think that there was so much information, and it was extremely repetitive, and the jury probably got lost and confused. And that's the last thing you want to see, is a jury not understanding the information. So I think Lewin is probably thinking to himself, how could I have been clearer? What more could I have given him? When, in fact, I think he should have streamlined the evidence that went in and given them a lot less. Yeah, hey, I, I'll admit it. I've done the same thing. You get so wedded to a case. You know it in and out, but you forget sometimes the jury in front of you, they haven't been with the case as long as you have. you got to kind of make it a little simpler at times, not because they don't understand, but just they haven't been with the case as long as you have. Now, Terry, what evidence do you think the jury is working through that's taking so long, though? Well, you know, it's interesting, Brian. There was a ton of evidence here. We have three different potential murders. Obviously, Kathy Durst is missing, but presumed dead at this point. They had a lot of evidence about Morris Black, even though there was a verdict in that case. They're probably still thinking about it because, again, there was a lot of information there. And obviously, Susan Berman. They asked for the timeline. That means to me that they're a little bit confused about what happened and when it happened. And so I think that's what they're thinking about. And also this question of whether or not Susan Berman was a witness, what does that mean? So I think those are the issues they're considering right now, Brian. Absolutely. Bit of a confusing instruction, but we'll see how it plays out. Thank you, Terry. And thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.